Welcome to the Dave Palma Show, the podcast that revives, restores, and awakens your innermost capabilities. You have the training and the talent to succeed, but do you have the guts to fail? I love what I do. When you love what you do, you want to be the best at it. Today is about the power of you. You will change the world. Find your path to success through the journey of those who have succeeded. And now, your host, Dave Palma. Hi, welcome, welcome back to the Dave Palmer Show. And with me in this episode, I have an anthropologist, former business school professor, and practicing management consultant. He is the founding partner of Experian, a workplace culture and strategy consultancy. Drew Jones, welcome to the Dave Palmer Show. Thank you, Dave. It's really great to be here. I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming here, uh, Drew, and uh, great to have uh, someone of, of a professor, <laughs> actually, a business school professor. And uh, however, although you, it's business that you know that's there, you, you probably have a good experience and and knowledge around the, the workplace culture in general. And I mean, you're a consultant anyway, aren't you? So you must have come across a lot of uh, leadership and you know culture uh, issues anyway. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I come at the whole uh, process of helping organizations with culture and particularly I'm a workplace strategist as well. So we, we design environments where people work, um, but there's a big cultural component to that. But I, I approach all of this really as an anthropologist, even though I don't lead with that with my clients, because, mm. you know, for them, it, that can be seem very exotic. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I come from a background of social science, evolutionary science. And so I, I look at human behaviors through the lens of, of evolutionary science, really. And um, it, it's a powerful lens to view it, but it's also not one that's necessarily shared by most people. Uh, most folks tend to have a, what I would consider sort of a, um, I don't want to say shallow, but a simplistic view of what culture is uh, as if it can be socially engineered like other aspects of business uh, but people are people and there's certain things about you know the way we interact with each other that are uh, uh, need to be understood you know from my view from a perspective of science mm -hmm. and that was really the motivation behind the book in the first place but uh, but yeah so there, there's a lot lot to talk about here and the analogies from sport I think are real, always important uh, mm as well so i'm looking forward to the conversation yeah great fantastic uh well we'll probably get started with that first um well it's no best kept secret that I, i'm i'm an ex-firefighter fighter um and i did go down the, the management route a little bit but i got more involved in the trade union and took a politics degree halfway through my firefighting career as part of the interest of that if you like um and uh, i'll give you a little backstage uh, <laughs> conversation around that um however um what isn't what is also no best kept secret is that it's been in the media a lot. Um, I mean, for me personally, you know, a couple of five firefighters and a chief fire officer actually. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I'm I've, I was obviously involved with a lot of um, you know diversity and equality issues as well and things like that from my perspective as as well as in general because obviously things like misogyny and that has to be addressed as well. But however, in the fire brigade, it's very white mouth culture I'm not saying it in a horrible way it's just um there's a lot of same as the police you know there's a lot of stuff that's been going on and even in America as you, as you know things got picked out and you probably looked at that with great interest yourself you know um and it's nothing to do with picking on one person when they mention the word systemic but what's happened in the fire service is a from my own perspective I also got diagnosed with dyslexia halfway through my career while I was studying a degree actually <laughs> so I, I had to look at the system and, and while I was trade union rep just challenge it and try for my own safety as well <laughs> say look listen this, this can't go on this kind of leadership you know and culture that's going on so in recent years uh, well during the pandemic one black firefighter committed suicide holiday was a trainee um, and it was a leadership issue and culture issue that's what they pinned it down to not one particular person on the ground that said yeah blah 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 and got him driven into suicide um although it's a it's a very stressful job as you can imagine mm -hmm. secondly 
in uh, the last, I think it's six months ago, or maybe less than that, about three, four, our first ever black chief fire officer committed suicide. He he joined the job two years after me in 1992 and uh, just got qualified as a chief fire officer about three, four years ago. Three, no, actually, deputy chief in the Midlands, near Birmingham, in London, in, not in London, in the UK. <laughs> and uh, uh, some things was going on, basically. But I, I think it's more to do with putting in the mechanisms of safeguarding than that. If you're a chief fire officer and, and that happens, you know. Um, I don't want to go into the issues of all that. Um, what I would like to, to look at from your from your point of view with that is um, how... Uh, the media's obviously looked at all this beforehand about two years ago there's some investigations into the culture and leadership and culture practices and said yeah it's it, it, you know especially in the Eng english fire service it's it's very toxic culture the leadership needs to put certain things into place and people now starting to do that you know from the top actually but obviously from the bottom they're going to now going to sack people and etc and i think they're starting to do that however how to put radical transparency into practice is one question and how to tie self-organization into accountability is another one in in relation to what i'm talking about there um, so we would like to have that question answered in general i'm just giving you an energy from my own experience and the example as a case study if you like um, but before we go there i'd like to obviously from a, maybe a sporting perspective um ask you that you refer to nike's former ceo mark parker as an anthropologist Logical leader with a high level of cultural intelligence, uh, which in brackets says CQ. Uh, what do you mean by that? Because I'm an ex-athlete, track athlete, and I've been yeah. around athletes that were sponsored by Nike. I've been around Nike since it exploded in the scene in the late 70s, early 80s, you know. Yeah. So I've seen well, that side, yeah. So, yeah. So Mark Parker, who retired a couple of years ago um, as CEO and uh, first of all, it's so many things about he, he, the two leaders that really jump out in my research for the book were Mark Parker uh, from Nike and then Satya Nadella, the current CEO of, of Microsoft, <clears throat> who both profile as what I call you know anthropological leaders. And by that, I mean in cultural intelligence is sort of the, the heart of that. Uh, and... and by in terms of Parker and Nike, uh, you know, part of anthropology is the, the field of the research practice of called ethnography, where you engage in mm -hmm. qualitative research on the ground, yeah. on the ground, yeah, yeah, yeah. And as a leader, he always did that. He spent time with all manner of employees at all levels, mm. treated them as uh, real people and would listen to their stories and get to know them um, and was accessible to people. It wasn't one of these things where, uh, you know, you had to book six months out a, a 10 minute meeting with him through his PA and all of that. He, he was accessible internally to staff at all levels. And then, and then really the, the gist of it is, is one of the reasons why Nike was able to ride that, what I call the democratization of fitness and make it, you know, so when he came in, Phil Knight was CEO and Phil Knight's motto was um, to be the number one sports and fitness company in the world. Mm. That was their sort of mission. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's but, what the slogan was. <laughs> it's part of that. Yeah. And, and so, and, but then Parker came along and, and his motto, his, his tagline was innovating for, for, all the athletes in the world. And if you have a body, you're an athlete. So he tried to bring it away from the elite athletes, the Michael mm. Jordans, the Tiger Woods to oh, right. okay. everybody. Can you, can you tell me what period that was when he said that? Because obviously I was around when Michael Jordan's new sneakers, or you call them sneakers, yeah. actually we call them trainers or basketball yeah, yeah. boots. And that was in the late eighties, you know, and, that so this would have been, I think he became CEO in 2000 and ah, yeah. okay. five. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, he was, he was in the firm uh, before that uh, as a product designer as uh, so, so, but he's an interesting case because not only was, 
So this is there are other dimensions to his um, sort of cultural intelligence. So when he became CEO, even before that, but especially afterwards, he really embraced pop culture in that he spent time and had these famous dinners at his house where he would invite not only athletes, but painters and artists and graffiti artists, hip hop artists, and became close friends with all of these cultural influencers from all backgrounds. Uh, and he said that was where he learned about the world is through other people. Yes, yes. And, you know, and so like, like for example, when they um, got into skateboarding, like they now have a whole product line around skateboards. They knew nothing about skating, but this kind of Paul Rodriguez who had won the X Games for one of the skating uh, events, invited him over his and his his entourage and uh, got deep into skating. And so in that regard, he was like doing this ethnographic research. And uh, and then beyond that, when they decided to go all in on skating, he basically empowered Paul Rodriguez to say, OK, look, we're going to do this. But you're the expert, so we'd like you to come to us with ideas in terms of what the board should look like, what the gear should look like. And our design team will try to make that better. Yeah. But we want to use the insights from the actual participants, the actual athletes to drive the innovation and part of that is was derived i believe from the fact that he himself uh was uh an ncaa long distance runner at university or at penn state mm -hmm. uh, at the division one level in college and yes. was quite good i believe he was an all-american in the one of the long distance uh and that's what drew him to nike in the first place was he was a runner yeah um, and so he was he was he was authentic in that he was an actually he was a user of the product. He was an athlete. Mm. Right? Um, but then he also reached out beyond just his own knowledge and to, to, to other athletes and was constantly in touch with popular culture. And so strategically, they were able to tie Nike's continuing process of innovation to what was really going on in the popular culture. So they, they became really an extension of an Amer of American culture. Uh, and that's what I mean by his sort of high level of cultural intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's, that's quite interesting. What did he have to say in relation to uh, Nike origin or Oregon? Because that was something that uh, the, the shoe came out then. And obviously there's a big athletics training ground there in Eugene, isn't there? Yeah, uh, well, Eugene is where the university is. Uh, oh, okay. The, yeah, the, cor the corporate headquarters is outside of Portland, uh, but uh, which isn't very far. But uh, but yeah, he was involved with uh, with he was been there a long while. He was there a long while with Bill Bowerman, who was the co-founder. Is also the guy that the original Waffle soul yeah i think i remember yeah i think yeah yeah you, you, the, the basically that yeah that they still got waffle souls actually yeah, yeah, mean, yeah. Still, yeah. But, but this this was literally uh when they were experimenting the, for the very first time they took rubber mm. and cut it up from other shoes oh and right poured it into a waffle iron yeah yeah and melted it like Mel molded it yeah and yeah, yeah, so this is when they were first experimenting with that sole, that that thick. Um, yeah, so he yeah. was there from the beginning, you know, at yeah, yeah. that, that training facility. Uh, and he would be the one as an employee, as a product de a developer, who would lace them up and go jog to test these out, you know, so. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. yeah so he was a real uh on the ground person and yeah definitely person. yeah like a yeah. navy like a navy seal or undercover undercover oh. detective investigative journalist that kind of thing um i did do my um uh um obviously i did it in workplace because now i'm i'm so i mean i was i was involved with more of a fitness coach kind of thing as my sideline side hustle would be like you know um but then i've with the stress and everything else I was talking about just now, the suicides and leadership issues, I, I shifted more to that side and, 
you know, the life coach inside and became yeah. during a pandemic with, with, with that suicide that happened, I got concerned. I thought, well, I'll pivot because obviously the gyms and that, you know, this, even though when I'm an outdoor person, you know, track and field and that's more outdoorsy type, you know, I think I play golf these days. Um, but I pivoted to um, resilience coaching and, and trying to apply that with the knowledge I had and what's happened to me myself as well. Um, so, um, I know that when in 2005, actually, you mentioned 2005 uh, when um, the CEO, Nike, the Nike CEO you're speaking about, came in to Nike, um, was when I wrote my dissertation on the workplace and specifically with the Pfizer, it was what I knew. I did an ethnographic research, if you like, because yeah. I already had that 15 yeah, years of. You were living it. <laughs> I had that intelligence already. Um, but of course, it's sad that even up to this day now, they're saying, oh, we've got to do something about this. And there's been a couple of deaths with it. So, I mean, it's like they don't want to listen to someone on the ground yet. You know, it's terrible, really, the way that's happened. So that leads me on to the two questions I asked you in terms of um, with all that going on and with, you know, the, the leadership and culture uh, side of things. Um, so how do you put radical transparency into practice? Because, you know, most uh, firefighters uh, on the ground would say, well, oh, you know, I wouldn't hold my breath with that. Um, and with every firefighter, you know, that has a responsibility around all that, how do you tie self-organisation to accountability, you know? Um, so it, it, we, we could do that in general in any organisation because, you know, I, I really want to pick your brain and your experience from this. Well, that's, that's really a core message in the book. Um, and most of the companies that um, I feature in the book, mm. do 15 little case studies, display some form of, of employee empowerment and, self, and, and create conditions for self-organization. Self um, but they do so in a, in a way that also um, necessitates high levels of accountability. And I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, there's a company called Morningstar, not the credit rating agency, but it's a tomato processing company of all things, mm. Morningstar Tomatoes, and it's the largest processor of tomato products in the U.S. Yeah. Tomato oh, we say, we say tomato, by the way, over tomato. here. <laughs> tomato. <laughs> tomato anyway. Uh, ketchup, all the things. So, yeah, yeah. But they, they are a completely self-organizing company where there's no levels of management and there's no nobody has a title um mm. and they all uh, when you so and it's all team-based output-based um, and you know compared to some sexy organizations whether it's a google or nike or tesla or whatever mm. you know working in a manufacturing facility like that is not you know uh, consumer facing product innovation it's not like the latest iwatch or whatever it's 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 you know it's a manufacturing company so the work itself is not the kind of thing that's going to get headline news so but but it's how they organize so for example when a new employee gets hired by morningstar they're required to write up what's called a, a colleague letter of understanding it's a it's actually a binding contract where the new hire writes down the, the value that they believe they can bring to the team they're going to join over the coming year. These are the contributions I feel like I can make to this team for this next year. Uh, but it's written to a specific colleague, a specific employee on the team. But once or every other month for the year, the recipient of the, it's called a clue, colleague letter of understanding. The recipient of a clue of the clue will go on the company intranet and post the person's progress towards their own goals. So if they're achieving those goals, they're on track. If they're falling short of that, then everybody in the company knows that they're underperforming. And the members of the team can by a vote after six months ask the person to leave. Um, so on the one hand, employees have freedom to join whatever area of the business they want, 
um, to organize their own hours, all these things that we think of now as choice and flexibility. But if they don't perform, everybody knows it and they're held to account for their poor, for poor performance. Um, and very similar at uh, W.L. Gore, which is a material science company that makes products like Gore-Tex jackets and stuff like that, that you buy uh, Patagonia jackets and a lot. They make, anyway, they, they have a similar process of, of high levels of autonomy matched with radical uh, accountability where uh, essentially employees can, can determine if, if a colleague's underperforming, whereas in a lot of companies that are much more command and control, you know, it's easy for somebody to maybe develop uh, a good old boy relationship with a boss and they get promoted position, salary, everything else, because maybe they, they go to the same club, they went to the same university, this kind of favoritism these companies that have practiced radical transparency say like everything's out in the open and you can't hide from your performance. Yeah. So, it, it, and it kind of, uh, it's similar right now. I can get into it in a minute, but Nike, I mean, sorry, Microsoft, this has been one of the things that, um, and it ties in with, with innovation uh, because the idea in this approach is that no one person, CEO or, whatever type of organization it is, can, can, by the laws of nature, no one person can have all the answers to every situation. Yeah. And, and so much of the insight about how something should work comes from the person on the ground actually doing it. Yeah. And so the goal in these organizations is to allow those good ideas to surface and to get rolled into what, what the company does as opposed to the quote unquote foot soldiers merely executing the wisdom of the leadership, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, we see where that gets us over and over with bad business decisions or business decisions in, in, in um, fire brigades and other mm -hmm. contexts. And it's really uh, acknowledging, and this is sort of the evolutionary science of it all from my perspective is that culture is not merely values and beliefs that people share cult in an evolutionary sense culture is what separated humans from other higher primates in terms of our ability to um, observe learn information and knowledge and share that in a way where that knowledge accumulated over the generations so that each subsequent generation has all of that previous knowledge and wisdom at its disposal so that whether it was domesticating agriculture and 10,000 years ago or the industrial revolution or the internet, all these things mm. were not done by one person. See, this is the great myth of Western ideology. Mm. It, it, not, you know, ideology is that the, the light bulb went off for one person and invented electricity or whatever. These all are processes that take a long period of time with mm. lots of people yeah. innovating and experimenting. And that's what drives culture is the continuous creation of new solutions. Uh, and also there's the emotional, the storytelling and all of the sort of beliefs and religion that people wrap around all of that. But, um, so that's really the model in the book is the idea that how do you, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you create conditions where everybody, not just the, you know, the CEO and the senior team can activate that side of culture where they're experimenting with things, not high risk things that'll cost money or lives, but uh, in coming up with their own solutions based on their own experience and sharing that. And then, having that contribute to the improvement of how things are done. And, and so there's research to show, and I highlighted in the book that companies that allow this kind of what I call everyday innovation tend to have much higher levels of employee engagement and retention. People stick around longer. Why? Because they're able to use the full 
their cult, their full cultural selves, and they can contribute beyond just showing up and doing what they're told precisely. You know, that sort of that sort of uh, uh, denuders a person's agency uh, to to just execute over and over and over, as opposed to having original ideas and being able to act on them and, and contribute and be appreciated for that. Um, now, I would say all that, that conversation about accountability, it, it does differ in a situation in a life and death organization, high, high intensity organizations like fire brigade, military, police, the ch a chain of command structure mm, is much different. more necessary mm. in those contexts than it is in, say, a tomato processing company or a shoe mm. manufacturer. You know what I mean? So yes. that's where you have to distinguish the types of organizations. Yeah. I think what the, what it is is just um, uh, they they still kind of say okay we we notice the difference between the discipline on the fire ground or the incident ground and then when you're back in the station or wherever that's the culture that we have to deal with do you see what I mean because you're not on the fire ground anymore you don't need that high stress thing where but then you're dealing with a lot of people with a lot of stress that's come back from something you didn't really want to see or do or whatever and but you know you've exposed to that yeah uh, but how you manage all that you see it's a leadership and culture thing isn't it really you've got people from all walks of life together you know obviously in a job they want to do you know together and now a more diverse culture and gender of people mixing together now in these jobs you know and, and it's something new to a lot of people from the old school days if you like <laughs> this is the issue we've got really you know um so that's why i asked that question because that I don't think the transparency of dealing with that from leadership to try and make that cultural change, you know, it, it is, I don't know because I, I haven't, I'm retired now, so I, I can't see it. And I, even as a, a still a trade union member, I can't sit down and say, yeah, what, what's going on here? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, in like, at least you can say from the American perspective, these days, police and even in the military. Yeah, uh, but you lived in the UK, so you got an idea of, of how. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, no, I, and we're, yeah, I'd say you know we're UK and, and the US are kissing cousins, as the yeah, as ex the exactly, expression. yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, just, there is a probably more of a closeness there than well, we kind of got that interbreed between Europe and and US. The US was yeah. really a former British colony, wasn't it? Really. <laughs> part no well east east coast anyway at least anyway sorry i right. interrupted you yeah, yeah. <laughs> well so so I, interesting for whatever reason historically and it's really becoming problematic here uh for political reasons but historically you know in the military here in the police and i honestly i don't know that much about uh the fire fighters associations here though and for some reason in the academic literature and the, the management side there's a lot of literature about police organizations yeah i've read less about fire yeah uh, fire, you know organizations but but there tends to be uh this really challenging good old boy racist bigoted Mm. hyper masculine oh boy school kind of yeah <laughs> it, 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 and it really is um something that i mean it's it, you kind of slightly referenced it in the case of the uk and it's absolutely a case here where um you hear stories with internal conversations or there's a facebook group um <clears throat> it, in was it in new york in P pennsylvania there was a tri-state area Facebook group for firefighters or sorry for police. Yeah, yeah. It turns out that they're like people in there that were advocating, you know, KKK stuff. Ooh, yeah. Um, and, and, and yet they're out there on the front line policing. Yeah, yeah. And we think that they're out looking for everybody's interests, but but mm. maybe they're not, right? And so Yeah, yeah. You know but that's I mean? not so, that's not all of them. That's just it's just what's what the bad apples they've got in there and it's the same hey you know what i can see in the organization i've been in and you know in london fire brigade yeah but 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 the same <laughs> time, yeah I'm, I'm not at all painting a broad brush but then no no but the, but then equally 
within the mili- ranks of the military here, you've got a pretty solid group of people who are all all behind, uh, you know, Donald Trump's white nationalism. Mm. Mm. And yeah, the fear is. is that if things tilted a certain way at a certain time, they might stand in and support him if he did something crazy. Well, um, the way the world is going at the moment with the couple of wars that's going on, he's the wrong person to be behind that nuclear button, isn't he? Oh my God. <laughs> it's it's on mean, the knife edge at the moment, really. And, it, you know, it's, it's being handled quite well, isn't it, with, with what's happened with Iran recently? It's an existential question for Americans because, but, but yeah, oh my gosh. I, but, <laughs> don't, want, but, don't, but, don't want Donald Trump there at the moment. <laughs> but, but my point only is that the, uh, there tends to be uh, in that macho culture, this overlap of, of uh, this kind of white tribalism and power and sexism. And, and you know, it's, so in that context, um, you know, it's a tricky formula to get right. I would, but, but leadership, it, it, this is just my speculation. I've never studied this environment. So I'm just no, sort no, of no. thinking yeah, in yeah. terms of where you're coming from and the challenges uh, of, of fair representation and access to career mobility and, yeah, yeah. and, the, and simply the freedom to not be the victim of racist hazing and bigotry mm. uh, in 2024. It seems like it's the it seems it back like, in time kind of thing. Yeah. Back in time. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but, there's certainly some a lot of stuff out there now about what's happening with the police and fire brigade in, in the UK. Um, so I, is... I, I will go look into that. Yeah, you know, yeah, definitely. Maybe yeah. curious about it as a yeah um, recent recent stuff really so it's good good research material for you to get your teeth into I yes absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah um real quick though because obviously we're going to run out of time here and i wished i could have spent longer with you and i'll probably have you on the show again actually because really i like to pick brains of academias like yourself <laughs> i know it's out of your context because you're more corporate you know as in real business like nike um but let's uh tell your audience a bit more what you're uh, where they can find your book and more about the work you do, where they can find you out more about you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I uh, I run a workplace strategy agency called Experient. We help organizations um, redesign their workplaces and put together hybrid working programs, mm. uh, including the technology that's uh, behind how do people connect when they're not physically co-present. Um, and that that's experient.work is our URL, but, uh, you can, and I have my own personal site at drewjones.co and that's where you can find both reference to my book and, uh, links to my book and at amazon.com. The book's called the open culture handbook, and it's, uh, probably most easily accessed on Amazon. Um, and yeah, those are my coordinates and, uh, We'll yep. hope, hope to see more of the maybe a new input, which I've given you now is, is for some research ideas to put on I, your I website. Lo- I, I will absolutely look into that. That <laughs> yeah, yeah. and healthcare. These are the areas. Healthcare as well. Yeah. There's, there's a lot to be going on. Yes. Where we need service. more. We Especially need after more. the pandemic as well. And the NHS in the, in the UK is in a little bit of trouble as well. So, yeah, that'd be interesting. A UK US comparison, comparative analysis would be a good good thing to start. Well, yeah. feel free to contact me anyway with anything you want, you know, in terms of absolutely, I will data and stuff like that. But yeah, we've run out of time now, and I'd love to have you on the show again. So, um, do contact me again if you want to come back on a show and talk about stuff. I will, absolutely. And yeah, uh, yeah well, once again, thanks for your very, very much uh, sharing your expertise. It's really valuable. To, to my audience yeah, i really appreciate the time it's a lovely conversation i really appreciate it that's all for this episode thanks for listening and remember if you want to support what we do then share subscribe and leave a review over on apple Podcasts, or head over to my website davepalmer.com and click on rate show well that's all for now but i'll see you in the next episode of the dave palmer show Follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.